Um, it's going to be quick. Yeah, we're going to be going fast through things. Um, we can definitely uh, take some time at the end for any questions, um, but we'll hold questions till the end just so we can get through everything. And then we can kind of pop back and forth as we have some time. Uh, also, there will be additional trainings um, that more specifically cover some of the other, um, uh, some of the points we'll be stopping on. So assignments, quizzes, things like that, things where there will be um, the need for more in-depth uh, uh, review and um, uh, in information on those topics. Um, there will be additional sessions for those. Um, I do not uh, recall off the top of my head when those are, um, but those are, um, I can definitely get that information for you if you want to reach back out to us later. I can, um, I can definitely have that for y'all. Um, so, all right, to get started here, I will share my screen here. So, with that, with this, and I will share my screen here. Awesome. All right. So, we will be starting here. I'll hide these controls, and I will head back to... Um, actually, we're going to start from the dashboard here. Um, so one thing before we get started real quick, I like to kind of touch on, and I, I failed to do that in the past, and I do apologize. Um, so it's something I do want to focus on now going forward is uh, being a little bit introspective about what um, your specific course needs are for Canvas specifically. Um, nothing in Canvas is required to be used. Um, there's nothing that you have to do this, you have to do that, or else the course doesn't qualify. Um, you can use whatever in Canvas you would like to use or not use, whatever you don't need to use, don't want to use in your course. Um, the example I love giving for that is before I was working at American University, I was working for Canvas, the company. I was working as a uh, support engineer for their global support line, essentially. Uh, something American University does have. If we click on help over here, um, we'll see it says uh, Canvas support and Canvas support hotline. That is Canvas, the company. We have a contract with them for 24-7 support. Um, they will be able to answer all the technical questions uh, about Canvas. How do I do this? Where do I find that? Things like that. They just won't be able to answer any of the spe AU specific kinds of questions of how do we usually do things at AU? What is the usual procedure? Things like that, where we are able to give a little bit more, hey, most of the teachers at AU do this because of this reason reason and that reason, things like that, more context uh, locally, I guess, for the local uh, institution. Um, but I do always uh, like to kind of keep in mind that um, they're available 24-7. We are 9 to 5-ish. Again, I'm on the West Coast, so it's a little bit easy for me to be available late. If you have a late quiz or something, shoot me an email. If you're a little nervous about it, I can be available a little bit later in the evening. My wife doesn't get home from work until uh, 9 o'clock Eastern time, um, so I have some free time where I'm just doing laundry, cleaning the house and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, definitely reach out to us if you have some later stuff. Uh, my colleagues who are in, in local in DC, it's a little bit easier for them uh, to do early things so they handle the early stuff. I handle the late stuff. Um, but again, Canvas support uh, is available 24 seven anytime. Um, again, technical things, uh, setting up a quiz, some questions not working weird and it's late and you wanna have the quiz you know, ready for Monday morning, it's Sunday night. Uh, you can always reach out to the global Canvas support and they can kind of help walk you through things. Um, and stuff like that, the kind of uh, more uh, technical side of things. Um, but again, it, it, most of the time they're able to help with things. You just sometimes might need to give them a little bit more scope just to let them know how things are done a little bit here at AU. Um, so again, on that um, on that point is again, nothing in Canvas, uh, nothing needs to be used. You don't have to use anything. Um, it's really what you need to use. And I got sidetracked there. Um, so when I was working at Canvas, um, it was uh, this was during COVID and we had a lot of instructors from uh, programs and schools that weren't um, normally and online or weren't conducive to being placed online, a lot of uh, trade school and um, hands-on type things. Uh, and we had an instructor, or I personally had an instructor call who said, I do, I teach uh, plumbing. I have, you know, I've never had a paper exam in my class. It's all hands-on. It's all, you know, I watch them do things and then they get a grade, stuff like that. How do I put that onto Canvas? Um, and for that, a lot of it was him being like, how do I use this? How do I use that? Um, and uh, kind of us at Canvas telling him, uh, you don't need to use that. You don't necessarily need to use things you don't need to use, obviously. But um, within Canvas, that again extends to um, use it as a tool for what you need. If you just want to post grades to students, that can be done. It's, it's a, a little bit more of a process than in Blackboard, but it can definitely be done. Um, so kind of the two camps I focus on for the more limited Canvas use is those that just want to post grades to Canvas and those that just want some sort of assignment submission location that's going to centralize and, and organize all the submissions from students together. Um, those are the two main, again, kind of Canvas light users, I like to call it, um, that we're um, kind of real quick going to touch on those um, just in their kind of individuality. Uh, and then we'll go further into some of the additional tools. Um, so I do like to start first with those. Um, and again, for all of those using Canvas, um, start with the grade book. I think it's a great place to start because it's one of the most basic things uh, users in their course uh, will need, both instructors and students. 
Um, so we'll start from the Canvas dashboard here and we'll kind of navigate over to there and walk through a couple quick things as we're on our way there. Uh, so most of you, if you're going to be new to Canvas, uh, once you get logged into Canvas, once you go through your AU portal, once you get to your Canvas account, uh, if you don't have that yet, stick around when we're done here and um, I can take your information and get your account created for you. Um, but this is the Canvas dashboard. This is where we're going to land as soon as we get into Canvas. And this is kind of the base view that we'll see and get very used to seeing this. <clears throat> So over here along the left-hand side is going to be the global navigation bar. Um, again, this is where we're going to have more of the account-specific things, global navigation, how you get to the global tools within Canvas, and then later we'll have a course navigation menu that has specific course tools that we'll navigate around for. So the first one here we'll have is account. You and I will uh, both have accounts. Some of these will differ from my account as an admin account. If we click on account here, you can see some of the very common account features, notifications, profile, user file specific to your user account, settings specific to your user account, shared content. If another instructor shares things with you, there are some instances in which it will fall into that folder for you to see it and accept it. Folio, Canvas's uh, portfolio typed one of their portfolio tools. There are a couple of them. Uh, the student photo roster. This is a uh, American University built tool um, that we are very proud of. We worked with a couple different departments to build this. Um, so this is going to reach to the uh, um, American University's colleague system where all the students official university photos are located. Um, so for example, uh, within Canvas, so this this image here, um, this is not my official American University photo. This is something I uploaded to my account. Um, so you can ask students, hey, upload a picture of yourself to your account. They do have a little bit more choice than their, again, official American University account photo that may have been taken you know, freshman year or something when they were having a bad hair day or something. So you can ask students, hey, upload a photo of yourself that will show to other users within your course when you post to discussions, things like that. It'll have your name and your photo so everyone can kind of get to know each other. Um, but beyond that, there is the photo roster tool that attaches directly to the colleague tool. Um, so this isn't visible to students. This is just for the instructor to, you know, before the first day of class, so you know who's going to be sitting in your course. We have this photo roster tool. Um, and again, these last two QR mobile, for mobile login, um, since we are, use our AU-specific login system, um, that's not something to worry about. And then global announcements. Um, so up here at the top of your Canvas dashboard, uh, if we as the university Canvas administrators um, we are able to post notifications here. Uh, many of the departments will reach out to us, you know, um, the main university, hey, uh, submit your course reserves request, things like this that apply to the entire university. Um, these will be posted up here for some amount of time. You can also close them out. If you're looking for a list of those, you can click on Global Announcements here and it will have all of those listed out chronologically for you. Um, so back here uh, to this kind of left-hand list, we'll finish up before we get to the uh, uh, dashboard page. Um, the rest of it. <laughs> um, this first one here, we can ignore this. This is just on my end. This is just the admin tab to give me some admin tools accessible. Uh, if we click on dashboard here, it will always take us over to our dashboard. We will all see, always see this global navigation bar within Canvas and always can click on that to get back to the dashboard. Um, it's just a great place to, if you get a little lost, turn around, click on dashboard and kind of go back through those steps. And it's just a kind of a great way to reestablish where you are and kind of reinforce that you're in the right location if you're a little bit unsure. <clears throat> The next one here, courses, if we click on that first, we'll get a little slide out that will show most of our courses. Uh, again, once you get to kind of a full slide out menu of this, it won't be able to add any more. You can kind of scroll down in it sometimes, but to see the full list of courses, we can click on all courses up here at the top. Um, and this is where you're going to be finding most of your past courses. So you want to find your fall 2023 course. Uh, you want to import something from that course into this course. Click on courses here. We'll get our all courses list. And we'll have all of our past enrollments down here at the bottom. So your active enrollments will be up here at the top and any past enrollments will be down here at the bottom. Um, these stars over here we see on the left, um, these, this is to favorite courses uh, to add them to your dashboard. Uh, so for example, I don't want this Kogod dev course to show. So that one is not starred. And we can see when I go back to my Canvas dashboard, we can see these five published, uh, excuse me, these five, five favorited courses um, are showing on my dashboard here. Going down further, calendar will go over a little bit once we get into the course. Again, this is just going to be a calendar of all of the uh, dated assignments or dated items, I should say, uh, within any of your courses as a user or anyone's respective courses. So we'll pop in real quick um, and cover the calendar. It's covered in detail in another training as well. Um, so you can see over here where it says calendars, this refers to the different courses uh, in which I'm enrolled and the different uh, each one has its own calendar, essentially. Um, so with that, um, you can see each one has a little color box highlighted here next to it. Um, that is the box that will show around each of the items. So for my Kogod dev course, um, they will all show in that little teal box when I have items on my calendar, which I don't have any. Sorry about that. Um, and we can also kind of toggle to hide them. I don't want to see 
uh, any items from any of these courses. So I can uh, deselect those and only my, uh, uh, so where it says Zach Schiffman, um, where it shows your name, that is just your account um, to-do list. So you can add things to just your to-do list within Canvas um, to give you a little bit of a better idea where things are and to use the Canvas calendar a little bit more efficiently. Um, and then you can see, you can add back in any of your other things. Oh, I wanna see all of the items from all of my courses all at once. And we can have all of those set there. Um, again, the calendar isn't a tool that you are required to use. You're absolutely definitely able to just post a static calendar on the syllabus page within your course or something like that, where you just have all the dates within the course listed. Um, this will automatically populate as you create assignments that have their own uh, respective date set, a due date, things like that. Um, those will populate on this uh, calendar for both you and students. Um, so just a little bit of an extra information for students there. Um, going down, we have the inbox here. The biggest thing to remember about the Canvas inbox is that it is not an email system, unfortunately. Um, and that's one of the biggest limitations it has. If you keep that in mind, it kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, it kind of makes sense some of the other limitations the tool has. So with being an internal messaging service rather than an email system, uh, when you're sending messages, which can be done up here at the top in this gray bar over on the right side, this little pencil on a square icon here is compose a new message. So you're not going to be able to just type .com. You're not able to just type in an email. If we hit send, that won't go anywhere. That won't uh, send externally to any people. The way we uh, generate, or I guess uh, compose a message within the Canvas inbox is going to be course-based. Um, so first you will go through and select the course in which the user or users that you would like to message is located. Let's say they're located in my sandbox. And... I want to add Han Solo. I want to send a message to Han Solo. So first I picked the course he was located in, and then I went through and started typing his name. Additionally, I have the option to select if this little suggestion drop down, we get out of here. Um, once I select the course, I can select all the teachers. So if I have a bunch of teachers in one of my courses, and I want to say, hey, we're going to do this for the essay next week. This is how students will submit. I can send this to just my teachers. You can also send it to just students, just TAs, different roles, specific sections within the course. If you have a undergraduate and graduate section, you can send a message to just the graduate section here. Hey, you guys have your extra essay due on top of the undergraduate level essay. That's due on Friday, whatever. But it's just going to be sent to that specific section. Um, uh, most sections will be created for you in your course. Um, if you have any questions about those or if you want sections added to your course to further subdivide the users, if they're not already subdivided already, um, definitely reach out to us anytime and we can help you get that set up. So once you have uh, your recipient selected, um, from there on, we have a subject, we have a... Uh, a, a text box here for the body of the message. Um, from there on, it's pretty similar. We have our attachments down here. We can attach a file or we can attach a media um, a media file down here. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, these attachments um, will stay in Canvas. And when I say that, um, that's just because uh, when you when anyone receives a message within Canvas, you will also receive a notification email to your email address on file, which is your American University email address. You will receive an email there that says, hey, this is a notification email saying you have a message in Canvas. Here is most of the text of the message. It usually shows about all of it for shorter messages. Here's most of the text of the messages. Click on this link and it will take you over to Canvas to the original message. Um, this can be confusing, obviously, because you're getting an email about a message. It's not getting an email from Canvas. In a way, it is. It's coming from the Canvas system, but it's just a notification about a message that you have within Canvas. Um, so same thing uh, for attachments. Attachments won't go through to uh, your email system specifically, but rather the email will say, hey, this is a notification letting you know that you have a message in Canvas that contains an attachment. Click on this link and you can go see that attachment. Um, it is just kind of a security feature on there just to keep internal Canvas things internal to Canvas. Um, but again, it has its limitations. If you don't wanna use the Canvas Messenger service to communicate with your students, that's totally fine. Um, there are tons of teachers that use that for all their course communication, it works just fine. There are some teachers that don't use it at all. Uh, if you would like to just email your students, um, within the AU portal, I believe, under the registrar's things, I think there is a list of, uh, you can pull up your course in the full roster and it shows with a full list of email addresses for students. Additionally, uh, reaching out to the registrar's office, um, I believe they're able to generate that list for you. Um, if you're having trouble finding it, they can just send you a big list of all the students in your course. 
copy all those emails, paste them into an email within your Outlook, and you can email all of your students. Uh, yeah, that's about it for the basics of the inbox. Um, uh, recent history is a relatively newer tool uh, within Canvas to kind of show uh, the again, a relative history of some of the past pages and some of the past items you have visited. Um, again, with that, it is kind of limited. It may not always grab every single page, every single mouse click, things like that, but it can give you a general gist of where you've been, what you've been working on, things like that, and just kind of help you backtrack a little bit if you stepped away from the computer, came back, and just had that doorway thing where you walked out of your office, came back, and don't remember anything that was going on. I do it all the time. Uh, comments here, we'll ignore that for now. Um, that's going to be a little bit of a separate thing. Um, a um, uh, is a source of uh, previously existing course content, um, uh, either uploaded by American University instructors or otherwise. Um, definitely take a look at it if you're curious about that. It's it's um, generally self-explanatory here. If we click on it real quick, um, you can see here, uh, search by uh, title, name, institution, or tag. Um, you can see it's just AU syllabus page template. Different departments use different syllabus templates, so that's not always going to be everyone, you know, things like that. But you can see here higher ed templates. There are a lot of templates. There's a lot of pre-created course information uh, for courses that have been conducted in the past and aren't now, or vice versa, things like that. Um, so definitely something to take a look at. Um, by no means are you going to find um, content for every single course that is taught at American University, um, but there is a lot of content in there that is definitely good content, both from American University and externally. And the last one is going to be help. I touched on it real quick, um, but this is where we have a lot of great information um, about getting help within Canvas. Um, so up here at the top, I'll start with the search for the Canvas guides. These are fantastic. I'll open this up in a new tab real quick. It used to be a lot easier to navigate and it was updated and now it's a little bit more difficult to navigate. Um, but what we will do, um, we'll start by clicking on search the Canvas guides. Excuse me. It'll open in a new tab here. And we start by just clicking this big red read the guides button. Down here, we select our role, student or instructor for the most case. And then we click on instructor guides here. So I'll drop this in the chat real quick because it is a fantastic resource. Um, not only do the Canvas guides have uh, essentially walkthrough step-by-step -step, uh, instructions with screenshots for every function within Canvas, multiple for each function. You can see how many there are for assignments and things like that. So not only are these a walkthrough of guides and information about how Canvas works, but this is actually the official internal operating procedures for all of these tools within Canvas. Uh, so at Canvas, there's a team called the um, documentation team. Uh, it is half software engineers, half former educators um, that work to kind of structure and build Canvas. Um, the, pro the product team works to always keep these updated because they're, again, not only are they external information for how things work, but they're the internal standard operating procedures for each of these tools. This is how they officially should work and do work in, in the vast, vast majority of cases. Um, I don't think I've ever seen an error. I've just heard rumors of them. Um, the absolute vast majority and with, uh, almost without exception, just about every function in Canvas, the official function is registered here. This is how it is supposed to work. This is official, both internal and external. Um, so if you ever have any question here or ever, any questions here, I should say, excuse me. Uh, Could you say one more time how that how we get to that? I apologize for interrupting. Sure, no problem. Um, so over here, if we click on this help slide out panel um, where you click search the Canvas guides, it used to take us directly to this page. Uh, but now first we'll get to this landing page here. We click read the guides. We select instructor here and then select instructor guide up here and we'll get to this full list here. Uh, and again, these are going to go through just about anything within Canvas. Uh, how do I create an assignment? That's going to be a really good one here. Um, you'll see it's kind of step by step. It has screenshots. It has little uh, little number markers, one, two, three, to walk through everything. Uh, this blue section at the top is going to be kind of a general gist. This is where we're doing here. Keep in mind this thing. Um, additionally, it will have little updates. Hey, this was just changed. This button is now blue stuff like that. It used to be gray, something like that. Uh, additionally, on the right-hand side, the in this guide section is going to be other guides that are mentioned within this one. Um, so this is a great way to, I'm sure everyone's gone to Wikipedia for an article, seen a highlighted link, and just gone down a rabbit hole of Wikipedia articles all day or for at least a couple hours like me. Um, 
This is that in Canvas version, essentially. It's fantastic for, especially those who are due to Canvas. You go look for a guide that is uh, relevant to you. You read through it and you see a couple links in it. Oh, if you're using this tool, this is how you set it up. And you say, oh, that would be a great tool for me to use. Oh, or I have an assignment shell or whatever, what, whatever it's going to be there that you kind of uh, pick up or have uh, or are more interested in. Um, you'll see links over here that kind of further go into that. Over here, we just have all of the assignment links. So you can kind of, you know, scroll through. Oh, extra credit. I was just thinking about doing extra credit. I have that extra credit assignment. Here we have extra credit is currently a non-default option in, that, in Canvas. Here are some notes about the tool and how to build an extra credit uh, assignment within Canvas, things like that. So it is a fantastic tool. Um, I, I, I dropped it in the, in the chat real quick. I always recommend to um, uh, bookmark that as well as also um, keeping in mind for students. If you have newer students, not only can you point them in our direction, we do support students as well. Um, You can also provide this to students. I'll drop this in the chat real quick too. Um, this is again, just fantastic for students. Um, new students that have not used Canvas before, students that may have used Blackboard in high school, things like that, that may need a little bit more um, kind of walkthrough of the tools and everything. Again, absolutely, you can point them in our direction if they have any trouble, if they're looking for any assistance. And you can also provide them with a link to the student Canvas guides here. So does A, excuse me, uh, does AU, offer like first year students intro to Canvas course? It seems like that would be a lot to lay on somebody without knowing it. Um, the, there, I, I believe that there are student introduction courses to Canvas um, that I believe, I don't know the process by which it is offered or if it is um, assigned to all students, um, but there is a kind of how to Canvas. Um, uh, there is a course for that. There are also, um, uh, don't know, if they are, uh, we have some videos, Canvas has some videos. Um, uh, but yeah, if you have any students that are ever unsure, or ever looking for more assistance with Canvas, uh, definitely point us, point them in our direction. We can provide them uh, with uh, a ton of resources and set up some time to help them out with Canvas as well. Okay, thank you. No problem, awesome. All right, so uh, we got through the whole global navigation bar over here. So now we'll head back to the dashboard and we'll head into the course. Put some tag out of my shirt. So again, here, the dashboard is going to be your landing page within Canvas, where you're going to be first um, uh, taken to once you uh, navigate into Canvas from your AU portal. Uh, so we're going to start by heading into, I do not remember which of these courses I had previously set up. I'm so sorry. This one. Here we go. So we will head into the course. Um, so just ignore this assignment one here for now. Uh, when you first come into your course, it will be empty. Um, so again, just ignore this. You'll have one default module with nothing in it. Um, I think it's just called module, not even module one, um, but you will have an empty course to start with. Um, so I mentioned earlier, there are kind of two uh, ultra, ultra basic um, intro to Canvas needs, just the gradebook needs or just the assignment needs. Um, and then, of course, from there, you can uh, extrapolate and use all of the other tools within Canvas. But those are kind of the two most basic. I'm new to Canvas. I just want to use uh, just the basics for now and kind of get my feet wet, get used to using the system. Um, so with that, I mentioned earlier, um, this is the global navigation bar for global navigation, obviously, throughout your Canvas account. And here, this is the course navigation bar. As you can see, these are all going to be more course-specific options, home, assignments, discussions, things like that. Um, you will find one of these navigation bars within all of your courses. If you ever do not see this within one of your course pages, you'll see these three lines up here at the top. And this is how you can kind of toggle it. Uh, hidden and shown here. Um, so again, sometimes in the gradebook, when you navigate to the gradebook, you won't initially see that course navigation bar, but we can click on these three lines here up at the top and regenerate that menu here. So we will head over to the grades page first. Uh, again, I do have that assignment and a couple other assignments created in this course. Uh, so mine will look a little bit more populated. Uh, when you first come into your course, you will see the student names listed. So vertically over here in this far left-hand column, you will have all your students listed down. And as you can see here, the assignments and quizzes will then list in columns going over to the right and students will have each of their grades posted uh, in their individual row. So for General Grievous, assignment one, his grade here, for peer reviews, his grade here, and so on and so forth for all the students. On the far right-hand side, as you can see here, there is some left-right scrolling into the gradebook. So if you're not seeing some things, uh, just go ahead and try scrolling over to the right, and you'll see those over there. And we have the total column over here. Um, so you can see here, uh, we have columns for assignments here. These are essentially going to be automatically created as we create those assignments. 
Um, so for example, assignment one, I needed students to submit for assignment one. They had their information, whatever they're doing here. Uh, they submit to that assignment. We'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, but once they submit, once you give them a grade, again, we'll touch on where that comes through in a minute within SpeedGrader. Um, you can give them a grade there in SpeedGrader, or we can give them a grade. We can do all of our grading directly here uh, through the grade book. So if you know what students are submitting, if you recall their submissions, you just need to enter it somewhere for them. We can just go in here, General Drebus. Got a one out of one. He did great. We hit enter. We go down to Obi-Wan Kenobi. We hit enter. He got a one as well. And you can see how we can go through and enter those grades for students one by one. Um, trying to think of the basics to go through. In the upper right hand corner here, we have import. Um, if you do have grades from another course you would like to import for whatever reason, um, it's not a super common function. If your course is a two semester course in the grades carry over. I, I don't know if I've ever even had an example of that here at American University, but if that's the case, we can import uh, grades from our past courses. Uh, a broken course, the, uh, something was wrong, it needed to be moved, move students into another course. Uh, we can import grades. Bottom line, we can move grades if needed. It's not lost. We don't have to re-enter anything. Uh, and to that same vein, export. We can move them, we can export them, take them out of here and move them into another course. Not super common, but they're there. Um, I don't know why they're made so prominent because they're really not used that commonly. They should really be hidden under a subsequent menu. Up here in the upper right hand corner, if we click on this little gear icon, this is where we'll get most of the settings in the grade book that you're looking for. This is the kind of things that shouldn't be in a gear, should just have their own button. Uh, so the first one is going to be the late policy within the course. If we check this box, or excuse me, that's for missing submissions uh, down here, the late policy first, we'll go over that one. Uh, if we check this box here, it will automatically apply a deduction to late submissions. So what that means when we're building assignments in a few minutes, um, there will be a due date section at the bottom where you put the date at which it is due. Any submissions after that date, it is marked as late. If we don't turn on this late submissions, it will just have a big late stamp and that's it. Automatically, it won't deduct any points or anything like that. It just lets you know, hey, this was late. It shows the date it was shown. It shows it was you know submitted the next day, whatever. It was late. You can make the determination. You can make a deduction or not, whatever. Talk to the student. But we can also set up an automatic late deduction. So if we check this box and a student submits late, we can set it to sub, uh, deduct 5% uh, for every day and the lowest possible grade they can get, for example, a 50. So say a student submits three days late, it is a perfect submission, they would have gotten 100%. But since it's three days late, five times three is 15. So they get a 15% deduction. So if you had scored them with 100%, that deduction would then bring them down to an 85%. The lowest possible grade is again, just so a very, very, very late submission doesn't completely bottom out a student score. It still allows them to get some amount of credit regardless of how late it is. Uh, some instructors will have the due date for assignments when they were due and the availability date, essentially how late students can submit once it's late, they'll have that set to the last day of the course. So students can see the due date for everything. They know when it's expected to submit everything, but if they do need to submit something late, they still have the ability to do that. They don't have to email you to reopen an assignment. You have to go into Canvas, edit it, change it, save it, let other students know, oh, that's just for this, blah, 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 all that. You can set this up beforehand so students can submit all semester, but the due dates for each individual assignments dictate how, many, how much deductions they'll have, things like that. But this is a great tool to make sure you can set that up all at the beginning of the semester and no one's going to get totally killed if they you know, wait weeks and weeks to submit things, which may be the case for your course. You may do want students to uh, to not get any credit for things that they submit weeks and weeks and weeks late. Um, but you can see here there is also an hourly <laughs> um, uh, deduction for finals, big stuff, whatever. <laughs> so again, it's just your specific course. However, you handle late policies within your course. You can use this or you can choose not to use it. And up here is going to be the missing submissions here. Um, so if the until date, which is the date at which it closes, the assignment closes for any submissions, no more submissions are allowed after that. This is if a student does not submit by that date, um, they get a zero or whatever. Uh, most of the time it's a zero. It's not often that students get any credit for not submitting something. Um, so again, here, um, the, the late policy, again, we can't turn this off. Off if you don't have a set policy, um, if uh, for whatever reason the coursework in your course isn't something that is time sensitive and students get a little bit of a leeway when they submit, 
you may want to just keep those turned off by default. So then you are able to go in as needed. Oh my gosh, this student just submitted four weeks late. Oh no, no, they're not getting full credit. I'll, and you go in and manually adjust that within the speed grader tool, which we will get to in just a minute as well. Um, so the gradebook itself is pretty simple. Um, uh, again, on your end, it'll be even more simple because there's nothing in there so far. Um, but hopefully your courses should have students. Uh, again, stick around after if you don't let me know and I can help you out with that. Um, that's all we'll focus on for the gradebook right now. There is, again, a lot more, obviously, with the gradebook tool that we will go into detail in the future training session for the gradebook. Uh, so now we will head over to the assignments. So again, to generate that course assignment, uh, excuse me, uh, the course navigation menu, uh, we'll click on these three lines up here. And we can click on assignments right here. And you can see I have a couple assignments built, but again, on your end, you won't have any most likely. Um, as it sounds, this is where we build our assignments in the course. Um, so uh, the biggest difference I like to touch on real quick between assignments and quizzes, assignments has uh, essentially one submission prompt, assignment one, peer review, uh, things like that. It is just the one thing that students are submitting. You know, give me your essay, give me your write up on whatever. Um, quizzes are going to be uh, a, a, a grouping of questions. You can't just have one question in a quiz, um, but in most cases, it is going to be a grouping of questions. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is the assignments page is the uh, quote home for assignments. Uh, each uh, respective item has their own quote home where they're located. Uh, but then also the assignment, assignments page plays double duty uh, in that any graded item will always show on the assignments page. So if you set up a graded discussion, it will show in some way on the assignments page. This is where all graded items will show. Um, and another function of that is the uh, the weighted grading function is a function of the assignments page. Um, so real quick, um, it is kind of a dual function between the gradebook and the assignments page. But if you would like to weight your uh, assignments within your course, that is done from here. Uh, so in the upper right hand corner, just to the right of the blue plus assignment button, we have these little three dots. And if we click on this, we have assignment groups weight. You can see it's already toggled on in my course, but it'll look like this first. And then when you turn it on, uh, the assignment groups that you have within the course, so assignments here, migrated quizzes, imported assignments, uh, those are automatically created, but you can manually uh, edit those, recreate whatever groups you want. Assignments one, assignments two, part one of the course, part two of the course, however you wanna break it down into those separate groups that are created here with the grade plus group button. Um, those groups are where we ascribe those percentages. So whatever assignments or whatever items fall into the assignments group, they are going to be collectively worth uh, you know, 50% of the grade. Migrated quizzes will be 30%, and imported assignments will be 20%. <clears throat> when we click save here, you can kind of see how that's illustrated a little bit clearer. Anything within this group, so all of these assignments, the total of those will be worth 50% of the grade. Same thing, migrated quizzes, I can move migrate, I can move this quiz down here, the midterm, the unnamed quiz. These items collectively will be worth 30% of the grade. If we just want one item to be worth a certain percentage, we just give it its own unique group like this. Imported assignment, say this is an imported quiz. Just this quiz is worth 20% of the total grade. Um, so that function in these three dots here, assignment groups weight, um, this is where we set the weighting for a group that is set based on each of these kind of gray assignment groups. And then anything within that group falls into that uh, weighting category. Um, so we did, uh, we touched on plus group real quick, quick plus group creates these gray headers, uh, discussions, percentage of grade zero, cause they're not graded or whatever we're doing. And you can see here, and then I can take my discussions and I can move them down to here. These little two rows of dots, I can click and drag and move them around. Uh, I think that covers all the basics of the assignments menu page here. Um, and now we will go into our assignment building, actual, uh, the building of the assignment itself, as I said. Uh, so we click our blue plus assignment button here in the upper right hand corner. And we'll get to a page that we're going to get very, very familiar with um, because this is the generic page uh, where you will create content for your course, assignments, quizzes, uh, discussions, pages, you will always see a page very similar to this. Uh, you'll have a title up at the top, the assignment name, uh, the discussion name, the page name, whatever the item you're creating, you'll have a title of that at the top of the means by which it is sorted and organized into the course. Uh, if they are sorted alphabetically, this is the order in which they'll be held. This is the alphabetical title for it. Um, we put our title up here, and this is down here where we put the information of the assignment, what you're asking students for. Um, submit to me a review of Romeo and Juliet 
from last week, whatever. This is where we're going to type that information, what we're requesting from students. Uh, in between those is where we have some of the functions of this uh, kind of large text box here. Uh, for the most part, most of those will look familiar to you. Excuse me, um, uh, font size, uh, paragraph uh, formatting, bold italics underline all of our normal formatting. And then things will start to look a little bit different here. So the first one we will see is this little chain link. Um, and if you can guess, it is for links. So if you do want to link any external content uh, to this assignment, we can do that here. External links are to anything outside of Canvas, a New York Times article, another article from somewhere else, anything outside of Canvas, any link that you would like to place, this will just cre uh, create that hyperlink for you. So you can say, uh, New York Times article, on your professor if you had an article about you and you want to share it with your class and then you would paste the link that you have right there as an old zoom link and then that would create your hyperlink for you here excuse me and students can just click on that link on the assignment page you can delete that here as well um another option we have here is going to be course links so if you have any other content within your course that is that you have created you can link to that automatically within this uh within this text box here uh so say for example you've created a page pages are just um as i mentioned earlier uh wikipedia pages pages are very much like a wikipedia page just a big old block of text that you want to give to students um uh some notes from something um an article again that you want to put a whole pdf of the entire article or the entire text you can create pages and then you can link those pages here. Uh, here's that lecture page that I created that everyone missed due to the storm. I want to link that here. And I also want to link last week's midterm assignment because oh, some of you did bad on that. So check your midterm before you submit to this assignment, things like that. So you can see how you can give scope and, um, and uh, association to your assignments with other content within the course by using this uh, course links option to link to other options and uh, functions and uh, items within your course. That's a better word. Uh, so next one here, we have images, pretty self-explanatory. If you want to upload an image, we click here, uh, you go to upload and you can search your device or images. We also have course images and user images. Uh, the differentiation there, you can probably remember uh, earlier when I mentioned if we click on account over here, where we have files, this is going to be your user files. I'll open that in another tab. We'll go to that in a second. Uh, and then we also have course files here. As you can guess, the course files are accessible at the course level to all users within a course, so you can hide some of those files from being accessible to students. And then your user files, those are just yours, accessible only to you until you move them, publish them, or otherwise uh, move them out of that personal file here. Um, so again, this is going to be our user files area. Um, so you can see here it has my name and then files. This is my user files. We have folders here. We have all of my courses. They each have their own folder. You can move things around, um, add folders, upload content pretty much everything like that. You can upload zip uh, zip files of multiple uh, files in one folder, and they will just go into a folder in here as well. That is another great function. So again, these are your user files. And very similarly, these are the course files. So you can see the shift and sandbox. That's the name of my course. We see our course menu over here. And these are, again, my course files. Um, they work exactly the same. However, your user files are only accessible to you, and the course files are accessible to the students in the course, or users in the course, I should say. Um, so again, uh, course images, things that are uploaded to the course user images are things that are uploaded to your specific user files section. We can recover those from here. Very similarly, course media and user media, same thing just for media upload. Yeah. <laughs> and then the last one is going to be documents. Same thing, upload from your device, course documents from the course files, user documents from your user files. It's exactly the same as files. I honestly don't know why they have it duplicated. For, I guess, clarity, but kind of. Um, so those are going to be our, kind of our upload features, adding content to an assignment, adding content to anything that has a text box. You're always going to see these anytime you have this very formulaic view of a, um, a title or a name and a text box here for information, you'll always have all of these tools. So you will get very familiar with them. Uh, continuing over to the right, this one here, this should look a little bit familiar. This is going to be access to Kaltura. So your Kaltura account is automatically rolled into um, uh, into your Canvas account here. You can click on Kaltura and you can access any of your content here. You can see all of my past recorded Kaltura videos, uh, uh, past recordings of meetings with instructors and things like that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Another great benefit of this Kaltura being rolled into Canvas um, is your Zoom account with, uh, with American University is also rolled into um, 
uh, or I should say attached to Kaltura. Whereas if you record any of your Zoom meetings, as we're doing right now, um, they will automatically, if you select record to the cloud, it will automatically go to your Kaltura account. So just as we are now, uh, we are recording this session for any of the instructors that have missed it, and it will be posted to somewhere. Uh, <laughs> it will be posted somewhere to the CTRL uh, page to uh, to review that, to watch it later. Um, and we are uh, we are running this through Zoom. We're recording it, and as soon as we're done, it will go to either um, my or Lindsay's <laughs> um, Kaltura account, and either myself or Lindsay will be able to take that video and post it for users to watch later to get this information and hear me stammering over myself again. Um, but it's all automatically set up. So if you have a Zoom lecture, you want to record that. Students are sick, missing, whatever. Uh, click record, select Zoom to the cloud. A few minutes after you're done, you'll get a notification: Hey, your video is all set and ready uh, in your Kaltura account. For to find those, we can just oh, yes close. To find those, we can create a page within your course. You can go to Kaltura. Once Kaltura loads, we can say let's embed. This is the video. This was my lecture. I wanted to share with students. I click embed. It takes a couple seconds. It takes a few more seconds. And then we can see here this video is loaded up into this page here to this assignment, and I can share it with students for them to see and go forward from there. Uh, so the Kaltura one is kind of it, it, its own little icon here, um, but there are also additional external tools, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, all the publishers, all those external working tools. Uh, American University has many of them previously loaded into Canvas for you, previously attached to your American University Kaltura, Zoom account, whatever. Many of those are set up. However, if you're not seeing a tool that you use, it is very, very likely that they do have a Canvas, um, either a plugin, an LTI, some sort of a tool that we can use with Canvas. Uh, all instructors at American University do have the authority uh, and the uh, 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 permission within Canvas, uh, technical permission, I should say, um, to add any external tool that they use. So if you use some sort of a teaching tool that has quizzes for you, uh, we can absolutely roll that into Canvas uh, as long as they make a tool for Canvas which most of them do. That's one of the biggest ways uh, that they bring in new customers and, and, and uh, uh, get business, new business um, to their tool. Um, so Kaltura is kind of its own. It sits here. Uh, it's very special. It's used a lot at American University. But to find additional apps here, we can click on this little plug for plugins. Very witty. Um, and you can see here, uh, embed Kaltura Media. So our Kaltura account is linked here, as well as Pearson and YouTube are kind of sh showing as your most recently used. But if we click view all, we'll be able to see the full list of uh, external tools that are already in integrated into the American University Canvas system here. Google Apps, Google Hangouts, uh, Learn360, Microsoft Office, Pearson, Sage Vantage, things like that. Um, they're preloaded in there. In some cases, your account is already associated if it's something that uh, American U University provides accounts, so Kaltura, Zoom, things like that. Uh, other ones like Sage Vantage, PlayPosit, things that AU doesn't provide for all instructors, but you can use. A lot of them have free tools for instructors, things like that. All you do here is you click on Sage Vantage for whatever. It would bring up the Sage Vantage login page. Login page. You log in. I don't have a Sage Vantage <laughs> account, so it won't go to anything. But if you did, it would automatically log, log you in or take you to a login page. And, and then you would log in, you would put in your information, and then you would access all of your Sage Vantage, Pearson, whatever tool it is, you would access all the content you have in your account with that user. So if you don't have an account with Pearson or whoever, uh, you may need to go to you know pearson.com or whatever, create your account, then come back to Canvas and then link them. You log into your account through the Canvas here, and you can push and pull content back and forth from Canvas to that external tool, however that tool is set up. Uh, so again, here you can see when I selected Sage, it goes to my most frequently viewed here, um, but we do have all of our external tools here. Um, again, this is just the kind of list of ones that have already been set up. If you don't see a tool that you use and you would like to add it, definitely reach out to us and we'd be happy to set up some time to help you get that added to your course here. Uh, continuing to the right, these are just some formatting, uh, alignment, spacing, bullet points, uh, paragraph uh, formatting, indent, things like that. Uh, clear formatting, if you are copying and pasting from a Word document, from a article, something like that, if things look weird formatting-wise, highlight everything and click clear formatting, and that'll remove, as it sounds, formatting, <coughs> any external um uh, formatting of uh, like the page layout, if you're copying and pasting from Microsoft Word and there were a bunch of uh, um, 
tabs or spaces before it. You can use the remove formatting to make sure things look a little bit better and things aren't being weirdly formatted because they were previously somewhere else. Uh, the table tool, you can just drag and drop if you want to build a table to put information. Uh, you can just choose how many cells you need. Um, uh, math functions over here. Um, they are pretty good. Um, they're not always the best with um, uh, they, they aren't smart. They aren't able to, you know, uh, they aren't able to know if you are doing an improper function. Um, like, you know, it's not like a calculator where you can put something in and it says, you know, divide by zero error. If you put a divide by zero with these equation editors, it'll go in there. It's not going to tell you you have an error or anything. It is purely the characters. So it is purely the equation characters, any math equations. They aren't smart characters. They don't know what they're doing. They can't say, oh, don't divide by zero or whatever other errors. They're just the characters. So that's one thing to keep in mind uh, when they first came out years and years ago. Uh, that was a fun couple days of students calling in saying, oh, why didn't the why didn't the math symbols do my math? It's like they don't do the math for you. And, you know, students should be able to understand why that would be a problem. Um, but yeah, so those are just the characters. Um, we can just see those characters there. Um, and the last one here is going to be for um, just an embed tool. Uh, if you have an embed code of a embedded video uh, feature, function, whatever, um, that was generated by an external tool, uh, you can paste that embed code here and that will add whatever you're embedding. Um, so again, uh, this text box, and I'll delete this just so it's easier. Um, this title in this text box with these tools, whenever you create anything, an assignment, a discussion, a page, um, whatever, this is going to be the pretty, uh, it's always going to look pretty similar to this. So this part up at the top, and then down here at the bottom, this is where we get into our specifics for the type of item you're creating, creating a quiz, assignment, page again. This is where we'll have our more specific tools uh, and specific functions here. So obviously going down, the first one is going to be points. This is the total point value for the assignment. It is worth 20 points. It is worth 50 points, whatever. This is the maximum uh, value that they can get. Students can be given a grade above that for extra credit. But again, this is for calculation's sake. This is the maximum they will get. If they get a 50 out of 50, that's a 100%, obviously. Um, again, the assignment group here, we touched on a bit ago. Um, these are the groups on the assignment page for organization of assignments, also for uh, the weighting of grades. Um, so again, whatever group you want to put this assignment in, but just also remember, it can always be moved later. It's never locked in. It's never um, uh, set in stone or anything like that. We can always move them around later. <laughs> Display grade as here is just as it sounds. How it will display the grade to students in the grade book. Um, they will always be out of 50 points. Everything within Canvas is always going to be a points base. But again, this is just how it will be displayed to students. So if you set it for percentage, students will get, you know, 48 out of 50, and it will tell them, you know, uh, 96, good job. It will show them as a percentage, and then it will show them with their letter grade next to it also. Um, complete, incomplete, it's all or nothing. They either got 50 points or zero points. They just get a green check or a black X. Uh, points, you will just show their points. It will also show the percentage and the letter grade for points. Um, so it's a little bit misleading there for points. Uh, the next one, letter grade, again, it will show also their percentage and their score out of 50. Um, so, but it shows the letter grade first, I guess. Um, and down here, when you select letter grade, you can view um, the default grading scheme. This is, again, just the American University default grading scheme. Um, you are able to click manage all grading schemes here, and it will take you into the course settings menu, where you can change that if you would like to change it a little bit. If you have a specific grading scheme for your course, if you want to add the A+, plus, whatever, um, you can set a specific grading scheme for your course. Next one, GPA scale. I have never seen anyone grade an assignment with GPA scale. If you do, Call me because I'm curious and I want to see why. I've never seen anyone use it. I can't even think of a uh, um, a reason. Why, I don't. I don't know an essay that's going to be a large part of your grade, and you want to give students an idea of their GPA received in the course from that large assignment. That's like the only thing I can think of, and I've never even seen someone use it. But if you want, you can grade your assignments on a GPA scale. Last one is also very important: is not graded. There are a couple different functions that are similar to the not graded function, so it can be a little bit confusing. Um, if we select points here, you'll see what pops up here is do not count this assignment towards the final grade. This will show in the grade book, but it will not calculate as it sounds. Students will see their grade. Students will see the assignment. It will function just as a graded assignment would. Again, they will see it. They will see their grade. It will just not calculate within to their final grade. If we do not check this and check not graded, you do not give them a grade. It shows 50 points, but it's not graded. 
It doesn't show them anything. It doesn't show any grade they received. It doesn't give you the ability to grade them. Um, it just shows it would be worth 50 points and it is not graded. It's a weird kind of halfway measure tool. In most cases, you would probably just do do not count this assignment towards the final grade. So you can grade students uh, a practice quiz, a practice midterm, practice essay, things like that. This is what you would receive if this was a real quiz, a real essay, something like that. So using do not count this assignment towards the final grade is usually better than not graded just because there's more information given and the not graded can be very unclear to students. Um, a couple of reasons they cross over. They're not really important because they're not Super great reasons, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, do not count this assignment towards the final grade. Um, I usually recommend that over the not graded function here, excuse me. Um, so next, uh, going down here is the submission type. Um, this is probably going to be one of two uh, uh, settings within an assignment that are going to be most commonly changed from assignment to assignment. Uh, so submission type is, uh, uh, again, how students are submitting to that assignment. Um, so uh, we have here a couple options. Uh, no submission, students are not submitting. Um, They're just getting a grade for this. So if we uncheck do not count sound toward the final grade, a use case for this is uh, students are going to see a play outside of class. They're just getting credit for showing up, whatever. Check in with you at the end of the play. You'll write down their name. They'll sign their name to a list, whatever. Uh, no submission means they're still getting a grade, but when students go to the actual assignment page within Canvas, there will not be a submit button. There will not be a text box. There will not be an upload field for them to submit work. It will just be a placeholder. And within the text, you can say, you're not submitting anything to this assignment. This is just a placeholder. If you showed up to the play and saw me, you get the 50 points. It's as simple as that, that kind of thing. Um, again, students are not submitting anything. Um, it will make that clear. It will not give them any place to submit. Um, this is just, again, you are giving them a grade for something they did, but you don't want students to be confused and think they need to submit a ticket stub or whatever. Uh, next one is going to be online. This is probably one of the most common ones you'll be using. Online just means students are submitting online to Canvas with their work, essentially. Um, with that, we have a few different ways we can allow students to submit. One of these will need to be selected. <coughs> Uh, the first one is going to be text entry. Students will get a text box just like this with all of these functions that are intact. So they can upload a link, they can upload an image, they can upload um, uh, a media file, they can upload a document. Um, so the text entry is going to be, um, uh, it, it has some breadth to it. It, it has some, uh, some latitude of what it allows students to submit. So if you want students to have some options, you can select text entry. You can also select multiple options and students will just see different tabs for each one, um, but you can also select text entry and that covers most of them. Website URL is just a website URL. If you only want a website from students, if you want a link to an article that they're going to be writing their final paper on or something like that, this only allows them to submit if it is a, uh, a formatted link. Media recordings, again, if you just want them to upload a media recording, it will only allow them to upload a media recording. Uh, student annotation is the one unique one here. <clears throat> the example for this one is um, uh, middle school, elementary school grammar editing assignment. So you are giving students a body of text and you want them to go through and edit it for grammar and spelling or whatever. So you will upload a file that is shown to all students as the assignment and they go and go through and do their annotations. They mark it up, here's spelling, here's errors, whatever. They submit that and then you see their annotated version as the submission. Um, uh, practice peer reviews, things like that as a more, more college specific example, I guess. And then the last one, file uploads again. If you just want students to be able to upload something, they have to upload something to submit. You just want a PDF. Um, you can require them to upload files and then you can also restrict the file type. They can only download or they can only uh, submit a PDF. It has to be a PDF. If it's not a PDF, they need to convert it into a PDF file. There's too many students sent weird image files that weren't able to be opened. Uh, again, we can select multiples of these. So if you're not sure, you can just select multiple and students will have the option. Uh, next one is going to be on paper. Um, this is almost identical to no submission, except uh, it gives you the option to upload a scanned version of a submission or a file for students. Um, uh, lecture notes, something like that, if you want students to submit something um, that they did on, on, on paper or whatever. Um, but again, the gist of it is it's very similar to no submission. You're just uh, um, entering a grade for students and they're not submitting anything online. Last but not least is external tool. If you have a quiz or something within Pearson, McGraw-Hill that 
students are to do external to Canvas. Um, you can set it up with the external tool so they will get a link to Pearson or wherever. They'll click on that. They'll go do that assignment in Pearson. And then at the end, Pearson will send the grade back to Canvas automatically. Um, again, this just depends on which external tool has this set up. It's not something we can set up for a tool that doesn't have it. So it's going to be something like Pearson McGraw Hill, a publisher that has content that has uh, completable work for students to do that. Um, but essentially, it's the same as, excuse me, linking an external tool uh, to a um, uh, to the assignment itself, we set it up, you click on it, you log into your assignment, you click the assignment, it's linked. When students go into the assignment, they have a little box that says, click this link to get to Pearson, they click on it, it opens it into a new tab. Um, we will have another training on LTIs and that, so we'll go into a little bit more depth in there. Allowed attempts here, this is again just how many submissions the student is allowed. Um, <clears throat> with unlimited or limited attempts, multiple attempts will never overwrite previous attempts. They will always stack up. You will always have access to all of the students' attempts. So if they sent in the wrong thing, if they sent in something bad, if they sent in something inappropriate, um, if they resubmit, you will always be able to see more of them. Um, a great functional um, uh, usage for this is for assignments due on Friday afternoons. Uh, I'm sure all your instructors know uh, when you have something due on Friday afternoons, you'll get emails all night. Oh my gosh, I missed it. I had issues with my computer. I forgot. I was going to France with my parents and we're in France now. Oh my gosh, um, I need an extra hour, two hours, two weeks, whatever. Uh, allowing additional attempts uh, makes it so if a student has a mistake, if they submit the wrong file, they can just automatically submit the correct file right after that. And they don't have to request another submission from you or another uh, submission attempt from you. Again, all of those will be stored. They will never overwrite each other. So you will always have, even if you have unlimited, it will store all of those submissions. Moderated grading, if you have TAs and you would like your TAs to grade things and those grades to be sent to you before they're pushed to the students, that's what moderated grading is. So if you want all your TAs to grade something and then you average it out or take the best one or whatever, you can use moderated grading. Not super common, but it is there. Uh, anonymous grading, as it sounds, if you want to see student submissions come to you anonymously, um, you can turn that on. One thing to keep in mind with that, remind students if they are submitting a document or anything to not put their name on it. It will still be organized and associated with their name. It won't get lost or anything, um, but just not to put their name in the file itself. <laughs> And last but not least is the assigned to category. This is very, very, very important because um, this is how it is assigned to students. Uh, if we remove this here, it is no longer assigned to everyone in the class. If they've already submitted, they can't see their submission. If it's been graded, their grade is no longer visible. It always needs to stay remained assigned to everyone that you want to have access to it. Uh, we can definitely create assignments for just one student for whatever reason, um, but it still needs to be assigned to them even after the fact, after they've submitted. If someone is sick and they need their own access to a quiz, an exam, whatever, we can click plus add down here and give Han Solo his respective, his custom access dates to this assignment. Uh, but more specifically how this works, again, I kind of touched on it earlier. The due date is just after which it is marked as late. Automatically it won't do anything, but if you have the late submission policy turned on, it will take that into effect. So remember the due date is just anything, any submissions after that date are just marked as late. The available from and until dates are really the hard dates. Um, before the available from date, the assignment is not accessible. Students can't see the details. They can just see the title, the total point value and the date at which it opens. Uh, your final exam will open April 15th at 4 p.m., whatever. It will close at this date. The until date is when you cannot access it after that date, very clear with that. Um, yeah, again, always add an additional one. We can add as many as we need. And we can also remove them. But again, we always do just want to keep it assigned to everyone because um, uh, removing that can cause some trouble. It's usually, um, <clears throat> it's usually fixable, but in some cases it's not. Um, uh, so I covered kind of the basics there. Oh, I, I went a little bit too long on time again. Um, we didn't touch too much on the quizzes or discussions or anything like that. Um, but if we pop over here real quick, to the quizzes page, we'll see a, a very similar kind of set of our quizzes that we've already created. We have a plus quiz button similar to the plus assignment button. And if we go into classic quizzes, which is the kind of more basic quizzes tool, you will see again, it will look very similar to this tool. We have our quiz title, we have our quiz information, um, we have our quiz details down here. And then the only difference is we have a questions tab where we build individual questions 
depending on the type here. We'll go into this obviously in more detail in the quizzes um, in the quizzes session. Um, but you can see here it's very formulaic. Um, the setup page is still going to be the same for the most part. Um, it's just going to have its specifics for discussions that are a little different, um, uh, for pages that are a little different, things like that. Um, the last thing I like to touch on though is the modules page. Uh, we kind of started from the modules page and I always like to end with the modules page as well because it's a functional table of contents. Uh, once you've created all the content within your course, your assignments, your quizzes, your discussions, you can see here we have menus for all of those. And again, it's a functional table of contents. So for module one, we have the assignment one and let's add the peer review. So we have those assignments. And then now we want to add, I have a file or a page I want to add. Oh, the lecture, I'll throw that in there. Um, let's see, I want to add the quiz because the quiz is in module one, add that here. And you can see how we can add different items to all the same group here. Things that are created in assignments, discussions, pages can all be added to the modules page as a functional table of contents. And you can see they all have a little unique icon here. Assignments, the little page with the pencil, page is just a page, quizzes are the little rocket here. And you go module by module and you can see how you can kind of build a functional course here. Um, uh, where you kind of section out content for students. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm starting to lose my voice here. We're at the end of time. Um, so I will go ahead and we will get to some questions. Any questions here? Uh, oh, uh, chat. Uh, the video later. Uh, oh, yes. So that will be... Um, I cannot remember. That will be posted somewhere in CTRL. I think it is... Um, I'm sorry, I'm totally forgetting. I'm not exactly sure where those will be posted. Um, yeah, I'll try to find that. Um, and uh, yeah, definitely reach out to me um, if that doesn't come out in an email or something like that. Um, and I'll see if I can provide that for you. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that covers just about everything for today of, of kind of the general basics here. Um, again, we didn't go into too much of the details of the other tools, um, but they're very similar. The syllabus tool, for example, again, if we go to this page, um, it does have a course summary. This is just kind of automatic things that have dates on them, things that are upcoming. Uh, this is unique for all students. So as they complete things, as they complete the peer review, it'll drop off the page. But again, if we click edit here on the syllabus page, again, it looks very similar. We don't have a title just because of course, syllabus is always going to be the title. Um, and again, we can type our um, uh, our syllabus in here. Uh, we can upload a document, upload images. If it's a PDF, whatever, um, it's going to work the same. It's going to work the same as the assignments page. It's going to have that same function here. Um, I think that was everything from me. Zach. Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, and sorry if I missed it, but I'm wondering when you give a grade to, how do you know that it's only accessible or seen by that individual student? Is is there something, or is that? System? Sorry, I was jumbled up a little bit there at the end. But this question was, um, uh, when you're entering grades, how do you know that it just goes to that student? Um, so students can't view this full grades page. Uh, when students go in and view their grade book. Um, they see, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I should share my screen. I'm talking like you guys can see my screen. Um, uh, there we go. Okay, so uh, in the grade book here, uh, students did not see this full grades page. Students will only see their respective grades. Um, so students will see the assignments uh, rather than going across here. Students will see assignments going down the left-hand side. And then in the middle column, they'll have their grades. Uh, here, let me head back to the I'll go into the student view tool. So in the upper right hand corner, you have a student view tool. It shows things as things would be displayed to a student if you were a student. Um, so you can see here, module two, there's no content in it. So it just shows the header, there's nothing there. If we head to the grades page, here we go. And you can see this is the student view. So students see assignments going down the left-hand side. They see the due date and the information here. And then they see their grades over here. So they can't see the full page, anything like that. They see all our totals here at the bottom. Uh, the assignment groups function as subtotals. So for the assignments group, their grade is here. Uh, they see their uh, their grade weighting system over here. Um, so yeah, students can only see the student view from there. And they can only see things for their account. Great, thanks. Uh, just another question that came up um, on the assignments page. I, I'm not sure I caught it. I know you mentioned it, but you as, assign it to everyone. Can you assign it to just one individual student, Han Solo? Is there any mm -hmm. downside to doing that if you need mm -hmm. something specific to a student? Yes, definitely. So yeah, um, yeah, I did kind of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, kind of harp on making sure it's assigned to everyone. Um, but yeah, that is again, just the default. If you need everyone to see it, 
Um, and if everyone is submitting to it, it needs to originally be assigned to everyone. And then we always add additionals. If it is just something for one student, we can delete the everyone, just assign it to Han Solo. Only Han Solo will see that. So uh, something that is very time specific, whatever, you know, you had to be in class on that day to take the pop quiz, whatever. They couldn't take it late because everyone knows it's on the reading, whatever. Now you can create assignments. This is just assigned to Han Solo. These 20 points will only be added to his account. So um, if, if the rest of the class, if the whole class is worth 100 points, if you create this assignment for just Han Solo, his grade will then be 120 points. What you would do for that is if we go into the grade book, I'll open it in a new tab here real quick and pop over there. Um, what you would do then, so Han Solo, say we're, uh, he missed the peer review for whatever reason he doesn't qualify, but you want to create an additional assignment for him to get those 20 points still. So for Han Solo, we would click on his grade cell here and we see this little arrow here and we get just this, this is his grading panel. It just has some information, his name, the assignment and through his speed grader, we'll pop in the speed grader real quick. And what we would do is we would excuse this for Han Solo. What that does is rather than making it a zero out of 20 for Han Solo's grade calculation, it calculates as a zero out of zero. So it doesn't exist for him. It is excused. He's not penalized for it. And then we create this assignment for just Han Solo worth 20 points and it's kind of a place filler. Only Han Solo can see it I'm here and I will uh, Han Solo assignment assistant. Um, we will hit save here and see it warns you. Not all sections will be assigned this item. That means dev sections, these are just the two sections within my course. Everyone in those that's not Han Solo does not have access, cannot see it. It's not in their grade book. It does not exist to them just Han Solo, but that's what we want to do here. So we'll click continue. Oh, oops. Online next entry. Some of them, if you don't have them set, it won't let you save it. So again, it's warning me. I want to continue and save it. So I hit save, head back to the grade book. I refresh real quick. So now this 20 point assignment is excused for Han Solo. And we can see here the Han Solo assignment. I didn't save for Han Solo for some reason. I don't know why that does that sometimes. He's not a real student. So sometimes it kind of messes with things. Okay. Um, I don't know why it's, it's, it's not showing it, but what it should show is it should show this box should be white with a little dash mark, um, for Han Solo. Um, so we should be, oh, it's not published. That's why. Sorry about that. There's a couple of little caveats there. Now, there we go. Oh, okay, perfect. So this it illustrates it perfectly. We have excused this for Han Solo. So this is not counting for him. This is a zero out of zero. And this only counts for Han Solo. This grade out box, we can't enter grades for the other students there. We can only enter 20 out of 20 for Han Solo there. He's the only one who can see it. It's only accessible to him and it only affects his grade. So you can see here, he doesn't have 120%. He doesn't go above the, uh, the threshold for the total points in the course. It just replaces it for him. Um, so yeah, the 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 assigned to section uh, is a finicky one because you can see for things like this where this is ob absolutely what you would want to do um, for this specific case. If this was assigned to everyone, um, so if this was um, if this was just you know assignment three, uh, whatever assignment two or three, and you just switched it to Han Solo, uh, everyone's grades would be gone. Their grades, their submissions would not be showing. In most cases, they're recoverable when you reassign it to them. Um, but you can see here they would no longer see this assignment. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, it is uh, very, uh, I say uh, finicky is a bad word for it. Particular is a good word for it. Um, it does exactly what is coded in it, but it isn't the clearest situation of what is being done in that. Um, so yeah, definitely give us a call, reach out to us if you're setting one of those up. Um, we can absolutely double check it for you, make sure it's all set up properly. Um, Cause yeah, it's a little bit particular like that. As you can see, it has, it, it has its, eccentricities let's call them that great and one one last question i'm sorry to monopolize but um i was told that there's uh, some software that runs through canvas when someone submits a paper um to detect any source of plagiarism or you know chat gpt ai is that uh set up automatically or how, how does that work is there a way um, to yeah, so uh, uh, a certain portion of that there isn't any ai or chat gpt yet um, so there is uh, right here, the plagiarism review, uh, it, it is associated with Turnitin. So you can loop things through Turnitin, uh, even automatically have student submissions go through Turnitin um, in the grade book right next to their grade. Um, 
it will show a little flag. So right next to the 20, it'll have a little rectangle. Can, and can, you, have can their... you share your screen? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I got to keep doing that. Can't see what... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Talking about nobody, not this one, this one here. There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, so when you turn on, uh, there we go. So by default, it will look like this. You'll just have this little plagiarism review box. Um, if we turn on, turn it in here, um, it has a very limited number of settings. It doesn't have the full Turnitin settings. Um, you can go to turnitin.com, log into your American University Turnitin.com account and upload submissions there. And you get the full suite of Turnitin functions, settings and everything. Um, but through here, it is a truncated version, um, just the basics essentially. Um, in most cases, you know, leave all these three turned on and then these are kind of specific case by case, you know. Um, but yeah, it will automatically run them through Turnitin. Um, this little floating meeting controls. Uh, it will automatically run them through Turnitin. And then the grade, in the grade book, you will see right next to their grade here will be a little rectangle where it'll have the little flag of the color of uh, red if it has more than 50% uh, plagiarized yellow, if it's between like 50 and 35 or something, and then green if it's under a certain threshold. Uh, you click on that flag and it'll take you out to turn it in. It'll open a new tab. It'll have the whole turn it in similarity or part. This portion was uh, plagiarized. This portion is a, uh, a, um, a, a, a cited source, that kind of thing. So this one's okay, blah, blah, blah. Um, it will take you out to turn it in and it will show you all of that there. Um, so yeah, basically just turn it on within an assignment and then it automatically sets everything up. It should already be set up through your American University Turnitin account, which should be through your American University email. Um, if you don't have access to that, just do the reset password thing and it'll go to your email and it's already all linked and everything. Um, but yeah, it's still kind of a truncated version. It doesn't have any AI or chat GPT stuff yet. Um, Turnitin had a tool, like right as chat GPT came out, they came out with a tool. It wasn't great. So I believe they rolled it back and it's not as prominently located. Um, but yeah, they are still working on an improved one. Um, but for right now, I believe it's still their regular Turnitin repository of previously submitted work. Um, uh, so yeah, you just turn that on within the assignment. And again, it is kind of limited. It doesn't have all the functions. So if you do need some of the more advanced ones, unfortunately, it may be something you just need to go to turnitin.com and then just upload all the students' files bulk into Turnitin, and it'll give you the uh, the full extended report for all of those in Turnitin. Great. Thank you very much, Zach. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Any other questions? Right, so we're much less over time than we were yesterday. Uh, so we can at least count that as a win for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, uh, hopefully I'll see you in those and some of those sessions soon. Uh, I will be doing some of them. My colleagues will be doing some of the other ones. Um, so yeah, if I see you there, um, it was great working with you today. Um, uh, I threw the information in the chat. Oh, no, not yet. I will throw it in. Um, I will toss our contact information in the chat again. Uh, again, we are Canvas, or is it Canvas specific. I always screwed it up. We are American University specific. Uh, we work uh, at the university here, not uh, on site. I am remote, but the rest of them are on site. Um, oh, I'm not sending everyone in this meeting. There we go. Our email address, canvas at american.edu and our phone number. Um, there are just two of us that answer the phone, though. So if you don't get through to anyone, uh, go ahead and leave us a message. It will come straight through to our ticketing system. Um, it will uh, uh, it will go straight through to. Um, uh, so, you know, if we're in a meeting or something, um, it will go straight through to our ticketing system. We can you know take care of that by email, something like that. Um, uh, email. I don't have. Um, uh, yeah, let me take down your information and I can send that out a little bit later. Um, well, here, I will just post a, um, it, it, again, for everyone, it's also uh, in your Canvas account. If you click on help, all that contact information uh, is listed over there on the left-hand side uh, in your Canvas account as well. Um, again, we are available Monday through Friday, 9 to 5-ish. Again, I'm on the West Coast, so I usually stick around a little bit later. Uh, and then again, the 24-7 Canvas hotline, um, I'll include their phone number here as well. Again, they're 24-7 available, um, and they can always help you out as well. Um, thanks so much for coming, everybody, uh, and I hope to see you again in the next session. Good day. Thanks.